Hello guys, Winston here. 2017 is going to be a year of making and self-discovery for me. In a few months, I'll be done with my second master's degree and done training for a half marathon. I'll be free to pursue my DIY hobby without the guilt that I'm neglecting something else on my long-term list of things to do. I'm not yet sure what I'll do with fewer constraints on my ability to make things, but I'll certainly be trying new things including selling some of my projects. But to really make that effort worthwhile, I need to develop a personal and professional identity. Every artist signs their work in one way or another. With my wood projects, the easiest and probably most traditional way to distinguish a product from my workshop is to mark it with a branding iron. You can purchase personalized branding iron attachments, but depending on their complexity and size, you could be paying up to $100 for one brand. That's not to say that these things are overpriced, but they're certainly over my budget, and buying one would deprive me of a great learning experience, especially since my casual search of YouTube for DIY branding irons has mostly come up with handmade examples done with dremels or angle grinders. We can do better, we have the technology. My idea was to machine my own branding iron with multiple faces and different text so I had options for what I could burn. Some pieces might be marked with my business name, the Machine Shop of Horrors. Gifts for friends and the like might be marked with something a little more personal, like made by Winston Moy. Really small projects could just be marked by initials. My material choice for this project was brass, which has a melting point several hundred degrees higher than aluminum, and is generally harder than copper, and comes in alloys that are considered to be very machinable. I picked up a piece of stock that was 3 inches long by 3 quarter inches square. The reason I wanted a piece so thick was because I don't have a welder. The only way I can attach my brand to a handle would be to tap my piece and screw in a threaded rod. I can bore out a hole on the back face and easily get half an inch of good thread engagement in my brass without weakening the front face. On the back side, I would also pocket out a large amount of material to reduce mass. Not for weight reduction purposes, but for thermal reasons. While you want your piece to have a little bit of heft so it doesn't cool down instantly on contact with wood, you also don't want it to take forever to heat up. To ensure that the sizing and placement of my text features would work out, I designed my branding iron in Fusion 360. I started by creating a block of material the size of my brass stock minus the thickness of my letters. I modeled my mass reduction pockets and hole to be threaded. To reverse my text features since they would be flipped when applied to wood, I created sketches on the inside surfaces of my pockets and extruded them outwards. My text would stand proud by about 0.05 inches. Longer strings of text would go on the larger faces of my stock. My own and business initials would go on the ends. I made use of the cam features in Fusion 360 to create my tool paths as well. The basic process involves defining the job's orientation, stock material boundaries, and cutting parameters. In my case, I wanted Z positive to be perpendicular to the face of whatever text I was cutting. The origin would be at the center of my piece, and the bounds of my stock material would be the overall dimensions of my geometry. My cutting operations followed this general order. First, cut a 2D pocket around the letters using a 1 8 inch or larger end mill. On my Shapeoko, I used a quarter inch end mill since I trusted the Makita to have enough torque. On my Nomad, I would stick with a 1 8 inch end mill. Next, I would go around the profiles of the letters with a 1 16 inch end mill. This would cut into the gap between words that would otherwise be missed if I jumped straight to doing a contour cut with a 1 32nd inch end mill. After defining the profiles of my letters as best I could with conventional end mills, I would go back in with a V-bit to notch out the corners that couldn't be reached with 2D cuts. To do this sort of reverse engraving operation, I created an offset profile of my letters and had Fusion 360 perform an engraving operation between the letters outline and the offset profile. Now with metals, I tend to get a little bit OCD. I'm okay winging my feeds and speeds when I'm machining wood, but because metals are so much less forgiving, I try and do a little research before I cut. Using an online calculator from one of my end mill vendors, I found that a good conservative feed rate for two flute eighth inch or smaller end mills was around 14 inches per minute. This is assuming a spindle speed of 10,000 RPM, the slowest I can go with my Makita router and the fastest I can go on the Nomad. Although I wanted to bring my Nomad to bear on this project sooner for its rock solid rigidity and high precision, I couldn't machine the ends of my stock in it because the machine doesn't have enough Z clearance. A 2.9 inch tall block of brass combined with the thickness of the Nomad's vise was just too much to clear. Plus, the low profile vise just doesn't have enough grip to hold a piece that tall. So I had to start with my shape Oko. I secured my workpiece as best I could in my crappy drill press vise and began by facing the ends. Then I pocketed out the material around my initials before going in with progressively smaller end mills to define my letters.
Lastly, I use my cheap engraving bits from eBay to sharpen up my corners. With the operations on the ends of my stock completed, I could move the project into the smaller workspace of my Nomad. In the jaws of my low-profile vise, I felt a lot more confident that my stock would be held level and square. I clamped down a stop block on one end so I could easily and repeatably fix my stock in the vise in the same spot every time. This made it so that I would only ever have to zero my machine once. I machined out the pockets and to-be-tapped hole on the back face first. This was the most taxing operation and I wanted to get it out of the way. I used a 1 8 inch end mill here so I could reach the half inch depth required. The most important part of this operation is really chip clearing. With such deep pockets, you need to make sure that your end mill isn't swimming in a big pile of chips. If that happens, you get extra material being dragged under the cutter or rubbing against the wall, and it's just not a good thing. Since I don't have a compressed air system or flood coolant, I had to come in with a vacuum every minute or two and evacuate the pockets as best I could. At the end, I decided to use my drill mill to champ for the edges. It deburred the inside rim of my pockets and gave the piece a more refined look than I could achieve with a hand file. Before I went any further, I wanted to get my one manual operation out of the way, tapping the hole I'd machined in my brass block. I bought a set of quarter 20 taps for this project that included a bottoming tap. This way I could thread the entire depth of my hole. Most taps you find are tapered for ease of starting and don't cut threads near the tip. Since I didn't have a lot of depth to work with, I wanted to ensure maximum thread engagement. A quick test afterwards confirmed that my blank branding iron could be successfully attached to a steel rod. Next up were my long sides. I went with the same order of operations as I did on my ends. Start with a larger end mill for the majority of material removal, before going smaller to clean up the letter profiles. This is where the tool length probe of the Nomad pays dividends. I can swap it a new tool and the machine will automatically recalculate the z-axis origin. I occasionally applied a bit of tap magic for lubrication, but 360 brass is fairly forgiving. Dry, uncoated carbide works fine for the most part. If you're curious about what end mills I was using by the way, the quarter inch, sixteenth inch, and one thirty-second inch end mills are all from Carbide 3D or of comparable geometry. My sixteenth inch one was actually an eBay example I bought in bulk because I was terrified I'd be breaking these things left and right. But amazingly, I finished my entire project with the same set of end mills. My eighth inch end mill was the only kind of special tool I used. This was an aluminum cutting end mill that had a more aggressive flute angle. I reached for this one because I figured I'd need every advantage I could get when machining deep pockets. The engraving bit I used was a simple carbide bit from eBay marketed for PCBs, wood, and soft metals. My engraving feed rate was about half that of my 16th inch end mill at 8 inches per minute. On my last side, I noticed a rather deep gouge on the front of my brass stock, so I added a facing pass on top of my list of operations. The last few machining steps dragged by with me looking on hoping that no last minute complications would arise, but with feed rates that were known to work, I was fairly confident the final operations would be successful. Removing my completed branding iron head from the low-profile vise was immensely satisfying. To make it a little more human-friendly, I went over all the outside edges with a file since they were still super sharp. Then I screwed in my threaded rod with an opposing nut to keep the threads in tension and resist backing out. It takes about a minute or two to heat up with my torch, but once it's hot, I can mark wood with it multiple times before it cools down. To complete my branding iron, I turned a simple handle on a lathe from a piece of scrap wood that had been donated to me. I finished it with Danish oil and polished it up with some high grit sandpaper. I did try using an infrared thermometer to gauge the iron's temperature, but its reflective nature made it difficult. I couldn't be sure of the accuracy of the sporadic readings I was getting from the surface. What I'll try in the future is carbonizing the back face of my iron over a wood fire, or applying a dark high temperature paint. That should provide a better return for the IR thermometer and allow me to brand things with more consistency. Other improvements I would try if I had more time would be to further thin out the walls. This branding iron has a bit more thermal mass than it needs, and it's still plenty strong enough to be pressed into wood. The threaded rod is actually the weakest link, so I may replace it with a 1 inch long stud and screw it onto a more rigid steel tube. Alternately, I could try screwing this onto an electric heating tool, which would also let me skip the torch. But those improvements will have to wait, because that's all I have for this week. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and if you want to help fund experiments like this, please check out my Patreon page. A dollar or two goes a long way towards helping me cover project expenses. I'll see you guys in a week or two, or three, with more CNC-related madness.